Hey there! And welcome to a new episode of Literature Snacks, the set of videos where I make an analysis of a literature masterpiece in roughly 15-20 minutes. Today, we're talking about one of the most famous plays of all Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest. It is almost ironic that the two most famous literature masterpieces that Wilde produced came out in the most turbulent period of his life, i.e. the period when he was firstly accused as a sodomite and then he was charged for gross indecency. As a consequence of this, he was sent to prison for two years of hard labor and when he was released he was forced to pass the rest of his life outside Britain. For more info about Wilde's life, please watch my video of the picture of Dorian Gray. It's another video of Literature's Next, you can find the link in the description. The importance of being earnest is a witty comedy about love, hypocrisy, morality and above all, it is a huge critic to the Victorian society of the time. It was performed for the first time in theatre in 1895, the very night when the Marquess of Queensbury accused Wilde of being a pseudomite. The plot develops around five major characters. Jack, also known as Ernest. He is a respectable young man living in the countryside, but he leads a double life. In fact, he likes escaping to the city under the name of Ernest and there he indulges in all the despicable pleasure that would not be suitable for a gentleman of his range. Algernon Moncrief, Jack's best friend, he is an extravagant dandy who likes to find any possible excuse to avoid the social obligations. Gwendolyn Fairfax, she is Algernon's cousin and she's a stylish and sophisticated girl of the city with whom Jack falls in love, Lady Bracknell. Gwendolyn's mother and Algernon's aunt, she is a lady of the Victorian social mores, highly judgmental and firmly committed into not letting her daughter marry someone of a high lineage. Cecily Cardiff, Jack's ward. At the time, it was very common for someone to die before their children would reach the age of majority. In this case, a lord, a friend of the dying man, would receive the custody of the land and the children and would attend to them and arrange her marriage. This figure is called a ward. Cecily is a daydreaming girl, never introduced to the lifestyle and trends of the city and keeps dreaming of having an adventure with Ernest. The scene opens up to Algernon in his luxurious flat in London playing the piano, while the butler is setting everything for tea, as Lady Bracknell, or as he called Aunt Augusta, and Gwendolyn Fairfax are coming over. The butler announces the unexpected arrival of Algernon's best friend, Mr. Ernest Worthing, Jack. The two greets and Ernest confesses that he had come back from the country to propose to Gwendolyn. Algernon then inquires about the existence of another girl, Cecily, as he had found a cigarette case that Ernest had left behind last time and engraved on the cigarette case there are the words from little Cecily with her fondest love to her dear Uncle Jack. Finding himself cornered, Ernest comes clean to his best friend. His real name is Jack and Cecily is his world. He's been leading a double life where in the country he goes by the name of Jack and he has made up a fictional brother, Ernest, whose scandalous lifestyle free him to go back to the city to fix the trouble he made. In reality, Ernest is his alias into the city that Jack uses to escape his responsibility in the country and leads a life of pleasure in the city. Algernon is not surprised at all in discovering that his friend is a Bunburyist. Bunbury is the fictional sick friend that Algernon invented to escape his duty as he often has to run to his bedside. When Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn arrive, Algernon distracts Aunt Augusta so that Jack can propose to Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn accepts, especially because she thinks that she couldn't marry anyone else but a man called Ernest. Lady Bracknell bursts into scene and Gwendolyn announces their engagement. At this point, Lady Bracknell has a private conversation with Jack and inquires his finances and his family relations. 
When Jack reveals that he has no parents, as Mr. Cardew had found him as a baby in a bag at the Victoria Station, Lady Bracknell forbids her marriage and leaves the room with her daughter heartbroken. Act 3 opens up a Jack's estate in the country where Cecily is studying German with her governess, Miss Prism. Cecily receives the news of the arrival of Mr. Ernest Worthy. It's Arjunan who wanted to know her, but Cecily thinks he's really Jack's brother. Meanwhile, Jack has arrived at the estate in mourning clothes because his brother Ernest has just died. When he finds out about the presence of Algernon in his estate under the name of Ernest, he can't do anything but to abide as his own lie had put him in this situation. Algernon is charmed by Cecily's beauty and asks her to marry him. At this point, Cecily produces her diary and reveals that, according to it, they have been engaged for three months. She had no doubt because she's always dreamed about marrying someone called Ernest. Arjunon rushes to Dr. Chosibo, the priest, and asks for being christened under the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn arrives at the estate to pay an unexpected visit to Jack, and Cecily invites her in the garden for tea. When they find out that both are engaged with Mr. Ernest Worthing, they start a sort of catfight, consisting in a duel of nasty remarks on each other until Arjunon and Jack arrive and the two girls discover the truth. Cecily and Gwendolyn are now irreparably deceived and confront the two men to know the truth. Jack reveals that he assumed the name of Ernest to go to the city and visit Gwendolyn more often. Argie reveals that he pretended to be Ernest in order just to meet Cecily. The two explanations are enough for the girls, but they still find that they're not being Ernest an impediment. And that's when the men disclose that they are going to be baptized Ernest that very afternoon. Lady Bracknell arrives to the estate with all her class and wit and interrupts this moment of bliss. As she has come to collect Gwendolyn and again remarks that she will never consent to the wedding. She also makes remarks to Cecily until Jack reveals that she is the heiress of a great fortune. But now it's Jack denying his consent to Cecily's wedding with Arjunon, using it as leverage to force Lady Bracknell to give her consent to his wedding. Lady Bracknell refuses, but then turns her attention to Miss Prism the governess, and accuses her of losing an infant 28 years ago. At this point, Miss Priest confesses that she had misplaced the baby in a handbag and left it in Victoria Station. Jack figures out that he must be the lost child and shows Miss Prism the bag where he was found. Miss Prism confirms that that's her handbag. And Lady Bracknell reveals to Jack that he is her sister's son, therefore Algernon has her brother. In an army list, Jack finds that his real name, as his father's name, is Ernest John Moncrief. And all the weddings will be celebrated as John reveals that he has learned the importance of living up to his family name. The whole play, starting from the title, is set on a huge pond, the name Ernest. The game is around Ernest, the name, it's a Christian name, and Ernest, it's an adjective that means honest, true and loyal. The name Ernest symbolizes different things for different people. In fact, for the two girls, Gwendolyn and Cecily, it inspires absolute confidence and it symbolizes the ideal husband. But for Jack, Ernest is an alter ego which he uses to escape the country and his duty to live a life of pleasure in the city. Similar meaning it has for Arjunon, who escapes the city under the name of Ernest to meet Cecily. Wilde tries to show that a name alone is absolutely of no use to define a person. Moreover, in the whole play, it is more important to be called Ernest rather than being Ernest, at the point that 
Both the girls commit to their engagement only because the two men are called Ernest. Moreover, the whole misunderstanding between Cecily and Gwendolyn happens only because the name of Ernest. None of them thinks of inquiring more, for example, their age or their physical structure or their physical appearance to see clearly through the matter. They assume that they have been engaged to the same person. It seems like their lovers have no identity, but only a name. When the two girls find out the truth, Gwendolyn states, neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. So we can see it clearly. They don't love them. They only care about the name. Obviously, in the Victorian age, it was the family name that mattered and the one that Lady Bracknell values so much and Jack doesn't have. Lady Bracknell, with her interrogation to Jack, shows the major concern of the Victorian society, the three C's, cash, class and character. Clearly, Lady Bracknell is more focused on the first two, cash and class. She doesn't really care about Jack's character and regards the fact that Jack is an orphan as if it was her fault. Indeed, she says, to lose one parent may be regarded as a misfortune, to lose both seems like carelessness. You may see Lady Bracknell as the antagonist hindering the couple's dream, but Lady Bracknell is only the product of the Victorian society in which she was created. So again, why is pointing his accusatory finger to the society? The way Lady Bracknell evaluates class is also a prompt for Wilder to inquire the relations between classes. When in Act 1, Arjuna states that the lower classes should be seen as a good example of moral responsibility for the upper classes, otherwise they are of little use. Eh? We get the impression that Algernon is more concerned with the morality of his servants rather than his own. The characters most of the time do or say the opposite of what they mean. Think of Wendelin when she says, in matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. Let alone the fact that the theme of earnestness comes up again, White here is showing of how far the hypocrisy of the Victorian society has come. Lady Bracton stating that she disapproves mercenary weddings and yet her interest towards Cecily is littered by the information that she is the heiress of a great fortune. Moreover, she clearly married Lord Bracknell just for money and we know that because she herself admits When I married Lord Bracknell I had no fortune of any kind but I never dream of allowing that to stand in my way. This is not just wild ridiculizing the whole falsity of the people living in that society, but it's a sharp stab at the Victorian habits to stand on a huge paradox. Finally, we see Wilde approaching the theme of love. Love was not an element to be taken in account when it comes to marriage, but nevertheless, Wilde shows us a universe where men are more sincere than women in love, and he places women in a condition of power. Arjunan and Jack are willing to do anything, even going through a second christening, to gain the love of Cecily and Gwendolyn who, on the other hand, threaten to withhold their affections just because they are not named Ernest. Lady Bracknell herself is elevated to the figure of a master of matrimony, deciding who may marry whom. This was a situation completely different from the reality where only men, fathers, brothers or uncles, could decide of the men that interacted with the women of the family. It's probably ironic again that unintentionally Wilde depicted a situation that would come real only in the 21st century, with women having more control in a relationship than men. Talking about nowadays. In all this contempt for a society of decaying morality and values, is there a place for the ideology of aesthetic movement of which Wilde was one of the leaders? Of course. Indeed. Wilde finds the way to explore the eternal question, does art imitate life? He uses the conflict of fact versus fiction and make them collide. Both Jack and Algernon have invented a fictional character to escape their duty. Ernest for Jack, Bunbury for Algernon. But fact and fiction 
manage to collide when Algernon arrives at Jack's estate under the name of Ernest. So much that Jack has to turn down his plan of killing his fictional brother. The presence of Algy in his estate under the name of Ernest almost puts off his engagement with Gwendolyn. Anyway, Arjunan and Jack are not the only two that craft fiction. Think of Cecily, that in her diary recounts of being engaged with Ernest for three months. Three months. And when she tells this to Arjunan, he wants so bad to be engaged with her that he participated to her fictional engagement in the same way Jack tries to change his name into Ernest through christening to collide with Gwendolyn's fantasies. Ultimately, the line between fact and fiction disappears when, at the end of the play, Jack finds out to be called Ernest for real. With this last action, White suggests that there's no need to question whether if art imitates life or life imitates art, because life itself is an artifice, therefore living life is a making of art. Instead of analyzing another theme, I decided to put all the themes that I could find in the play in the previous section. And now I will only analyze the symbols of the play. This could be useful for you if you're working on any project like Maturita Tesina or if you're trying to connect more literature masterpieces all together. I really hope that that will be useful for you. So to underline his ideas, Wilde filled the play with symbols that resent to the idea he wants to express. Town and country, tea service and food are the three symbols that one uses to speak about society. Town and country. For Algernon and Jack, town and country are their way out of duties. Jack escapes from the country while Algernon escapes from the city, but the conflict between town and country is raised furthermore by Cecily and Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn was raised in the city and makes a lot of remarks on Cecily's lack of taste. Cecily, on the other hand, associates the city with vulgarity and snobbiness. White subverts the general idea that society has of town and country at the time, well expressed by Gwendolyn, by suggesting that both town and country can be placed for fantasy and escape. The tea service is a moment in which several important scenes take place. Think of the cat fight between Gwendolyn and Cecily. A very mundane moment like tea service is more of a ring for fight. The characters there negotiate a tense social situation under a mask of civility. Food is there to symbolize the excess of society. Arjunan can't stop eating, even in tense situations, suggesting he, that his extravagance reflects on his appetite. Keep in mind that in the London of the Victorian age, hunger was commonplace for lower classes. The access to food, especially the abundance of food, was a clear sign of one's social status. Don't forget that both Oscar Wilde and Charles Dickens write in the same period, the Victorian age. Bunbury and Ernest are the symbols of deception, escapism and fiction. They are the excuse that both Arjunan and Jack used to evade, but Ernest is also the symbol of idealism, as both Gwendolyn and Cecily confer to the name qualities that their lovers may even not have, but the name is sufficient for their fantasies to remain alive. The conflict between fact and fiction resonates through symbols like diaries, love letters and Miss Brim's three-volume novel. Diaries are supposed to record real-life events, but Cecily wrote her fictional engagement with Ernest in her, making it a symbol of the conflict between fact and fiction. Similarly, Gwendolyn has a diary in which she recorded her own engagement with Ernest, which is more real than Cecily's one, but is not real anyway. The love letters that Cecily has crafted between her and Ernest are another example of fiction making. And last but not least, the three-volume novel written by Miss Prism is the symbol of lost the sense of reality due to fiction, at the point that she misplaces Baby Jack and the novel and puts the infant in the bag and the novel in the stroller. The Dandy 
The dandy is a figure popularized by Wilde and uh, its men that pays particular attention to clothes, appearance and lifestyle. Nowadays we call him metrosexual. Algernon and Jack are two real dandies, as we can see also when Jack wears mourning clothes for a brother that doesn't even exist and is not even dead. The fluid nature of identity is expressed through the act of christening. The Jack and Algernon ask to Dr. Chosibo to perform in order to change their names into Ernest. Finally, the double life that Algernon and Jack appears in the symbols of Jack's cigarette case and Jack's business card. The Jack cigarette case that forces Jack to reveal his real name to Algie and Jack's business card stored in the cigarette case of Uncle Jack, but they bear the name of Ernest and his address in London. Same business card that Arjunon will use to introduce himself as Ernest to Cecily. Despite the fact that short after his publication, Wilder was sent to prison and his reputation was damaged forever, the importance of being Ernest remains a masterpiece of depicting Victorian society with all its fault, in a unique, witty language that few artists were able to create. It is also a very modern piece, counting that we still struggle a lot with appearances. Think of how the Instagram phenomenon with its influence is growing nowadays. We can easily imagine Gwendolyn and Sassany as two important influencers that refuse to marry Jack and Arjun because they don't have enough followers. There are two films adaptation of the play, one was made in 1952 and one was made in 2002 that I sincerely recommend because it has a wonderful cast with Colin Firth as Jack, Rupert Everett as Algernon and Judi Dench as Lady Bracknell. Oliver Parker, the director, has successfully managed to include all the symbols that Wilde emphasized and he also used some wonderful places for the scene that truly recalled Wilde and his being a dandy. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you like it, please give us a like. If you want to keep being updated with the videos of literature that I release, please ring the bell and remember that we are a language school. We teach English, French, Spanish, German and Italian for foreigners. We teach adults as well as teenagers. This is our Facebook page. This is our Instagram page. This is our email address. You can write to us and ask any question that you want to request lessons of language or explanation on literature. In the meantime, since this is the first Literature Snacks of 2022, I wish you a very happy new year and I hope to see you soon online and even at the school if you want to pass by. Bye bye!